Um, why don't we leap right in because we got some meaty passages here, so we could spend <laughs> an awful long time talking about them. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how we do. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending your Spirit. Um, the Spirit has inspired Isaiah, inspired Matthew, and I pray inspires us today to understand your Word and apply it to our daily lives. This is for the second Sunday of Advent, and we remember Jesus' first coming, and we prepare for Christmas, but we also look forward to the day when he will come again in glory, and that he might um, you know, wipe away every tear from every eye and set things right. But I pray, Lord, not only would he, we look forward to his coming in glory, but that we look forward to his coming to us every day, because I know you come to us in many, many different ways. Um, just open our eyes to see you as you come to us now. We might be inspired to learn and, and mark and inwardly digest whatever you give to us. Give us the humility to learn from one another, O oh Lord, and to leave here with just a greater knowledge and love of you. These things I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Mm. Okie dokie. Who wants to read Isaiah 11 for us? Well, want to give us John? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version. Not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> the Righteous Rain of the Branch <clears throat> is the title of this, beginning of this chapter. Chapter 11, reading from verse 1. There shall <coughs> come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch... From his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fat, fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow, the and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's head. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And verse 10, in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks to God. So I'd wager that many of you have heard this passage before. It comes in the Messiah, I believe. It also is often read in Advent, Lessons and Carol Services. So the one we'll have on Saturday, it's going to come up. What um, what jumps out at you, though? Christine. Well, just listening to the words and visualizing what a wonderful place it will be. I could I just a Louis Armstrong song. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I never thought of that. <laughs> but it was just, just, just listening to the words and what it's telling us of what's to come, mm. and to think of what's going on, and to think, oh, this just sounds like peace on earth, 
oh, we need sure. it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sarah. Um, verses uh, six through nine, is that sort of uh, talking about the new earth? Um, or uh, is that meant to be nowadays? But the question, because it's interesting that we are in between two advents, right? So in the one sense, we celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace at Christmas. But in another sense, we await the coming of the Prince of Peace at the end of, of days. So we're, we're in this in-between time where we're given a vision and we're given the, the sort of visual embodiment or the human embodiment of it. Jesus is the man of peace. And so Jesus shows us what we will be, right? We will be people of peace. We will have, and Jesus, of course, was born in a barn with, you know, probably not uh, lions and fatlings, but uh, calves and, and who knows what sheep were there. So that imagery with shepherds as well clearly uh, indicates that Jesus is, is his first coming is a foretaste of the second coming. And we talk about the uh, altar being, you know, a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. There's this idea that we are uh, taking this, this food at the Eucharist. And this is a taste of what the heavenly banquet will be. And I imagine it'll be tastier than those wafers that we eat, which are not very flavorful. <laughs> but of course, we, we get something out of it in that we do believe Jesus is really present. But also, you know, I, I think people legitimately would say, you know, um, something is changing in me because of me receiving with faith, receiving Jesus with faith, both the word uh, in, in verbal form and then the word in, in physical form in the, in the, in the written one. So it's a long way of saying, I think it's both. It's both a vision of how we are to live today, but a vision of only will be completed and perfected in the, in the future that we might, might take on. A couple of things I wanted to draw out for us, and then we can go back and forth with questions, because I'm sure you have your own thoughts, because it's very, um, like I said, very, very um, strong imagery. So those who have a strong imagine, imagination and can visualize, it's probably some of the passages that are really, really powerful for you. So the first off is to note where this shoot comes from. Do you know where, what do you think this is alluding to in verse one of chapter 11? David. So you've got David. So Jesse is David's father, if you remember. But you notice it's interesting. Uh, Isaiah prophesies. So in the, the basically when, when Israel's, well, through some better times. So he talks to Hezekiah, for example, who's one of the good kings. But he also presides over progressively worse times mm -hmm. and foresees something terrible before this wonderful thing because if you think about the shoot shall come out of the stump of jesse how do you get a stump you get a stump because the tree's been chopped down and it's not here's a shoot out of the stump of david but it goes one generation under david down to jesse so what you're ending up with is like the whole davidic kingdom is gone like it's, it's gone where's the hope it's not that, oh, I'm going to put a big Band-Aid on this tree, put it back on the stump. It's this, this tree's gone. And I'm bringing a new shoot out of it, something new. And so it's an indication both of Isaiah's woe, which is some bad stuff's going to happen. But just like in the cross, right? Terrible thing. Terrible travesty of justice. But look forward to the resurrection. So this is almost like a kind of, He's not referencing the resurrection, I think, but a kind of resurrection theme idea, which is like complete destruction. Like there's no hope right off Israel. Nothing's ever coming back. Oh, wait, God's brought this shoot out of this stump here. And there's new hope because God's going to do something new that fulfills his promises, but not through the route that we thought it was going to be, which is you're always going to have, you know, one of David's, uh, you know, physical ancestors physically leading Israel. I think it's pointing towards Jesus, a descendant of, of Jesse. Anyway, Christine, you had your hand up. Yeah, if if you consider us, you started talking about a stump. Yep. But not every stump does it reproduce. Mm -hmm. If it, in real life, when a tree is cut down, it's not necessarily will it sprout back up again. True. And also, if you think of the pruning through the scriptures, how it's mentioned that 
this pruning has to take place in certain area in certain trees for it to grow mm -hmm. strong and straight and i think this, this is all from now and as we go in through the old testament into the new this is how to me the stump is regrowing and getting stronger to Chris, well, the birth of Christ. So one of the things, and I see your hand there, Margaret, I'll get to you in just a sec. It just came to me when you were talking there, Christine. Do you notice a lot of fruit trees when you buy them? Uh, if you buy them at a nursery, you'll find this little knob at the bottom because they're actually roots from a different tree because mm -hmm. the fruit tree doesn't have a strong root structure or maybe it's not adapted to the conditions that we live in. So it's very typical that you'd have a different root and then a tree put onto it. And it's partly just to sort of say that um, what, what you're getting out of this is, is that human beings have sort of worked with nature to engineer a tree that has the qualities of a fruit tree, but also the qualities of a stronger root system from a different tree. And that sort of made me think about what might be a better you know, image to be using. Mm -hmm. Margaret, you had a, a question or comment. Yes, to me, the most important word in these phrases is root. Mm -hmm. It's not coming out of the stump. It's coming out of the root mm -hmm. that fed the stump. And when I think of that, this um, is symbolic. What is the root of everything? What is the beginning of creation? The root started that, you know, that's the basis of the tree. To me, the root is God, the origin of this, this whole um, picture that we've drawn here about the stump and the tree yeah not to forget like we're, where we're grounded right which is you know trees don't float around um they're grounded into something deep and they literally grounded they're in the ground and so where are the roots well i mean the the, the wellspring of all life is is god himself and and remember that that's what's holding fast right yeah that's what feeds One. everything yeah. Yeah, and, and sort of the, the, the deep well, the, the waters, the nutrients, everything comes up through the root. So you can have a grand tree, but no root system it means like it's, a... all, uh, it's all completely disastrous. So I got uh, Bill and then Christine. Oh, I was just going to make a start with a comment on root systems. Uh, one year at our cottage, we had a terrible thunderstorm. And this pine tree that at its base was so big, you couldn't put your arms around it. <laughs> and it kind of went right over with a sigh, uh, oh. hardly made a sound. And uh, when we went and looked at it, its root system was only about six inches deep. And the wind came along and pushed it right over. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the, the two things about this scripture, one in response to Sarah's question about the fulfillment, you know, of the, of the prophecy. Um, we have to be um, we have to be careful in look in, in looking at the question of fulfillment um, because uh, there are some who will claim fulfillment of you know the the child will put his hand on the neck of the adder um, right. uh, in in this time and in this place uh, in the in the states why not but in the States, uh, there are churches called the snake handlers. Yep. And they, they bring a bucket full of venomous snakes into, into their public worship. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, the, the preacher will invariably take one of these snakes in his hand and uh, claim, I have authority given to me by the prophecy of God and we're the fulfillment of the kingdom, etc., etc. And invariably the snake bites him and he dies. But um, we have to be careful when we, when we look at the question of fulfillment. And then building on that, um, we have to see one of the, in the text that I'm using, um, the, the word justice appears many times. Uh, as in four, he shall judge the poor with justice um, and uh, round his waist, he shall wear the belt of justice. Other texts may put a different word in that context, but the text that I'm using. 
And we have to remember that the, in the biblical context, the word justice doesn't mean what it means today. Uh, as in the legal system, catch a guy, put him before a judge in the justice system. The word justice here means something like uh, reconciliation and restoration, as in we are all brought into a good, non-adversarial, non-destructive <laughs> creative loving relationship and i uh, can't put enough adjectives around that to to begin to describe it but y'all know what i mean and and when we think about the text of the uh the cow and the bear the um the lion and the cattle the infant and the cobra the young and the viper's nest <clears throat> We're talking about a vision of creation, which is fulfilled in Christ, but is not absolutely fulfilled in our time. Mm -hmm. And um, so we need to uh, look forward to the day when uh, last week we had uh, the, the text, I think, and they shall study the ways of war no more. Mm -hmm. We look forward to that time. Uh, we look forward to the fulfillment, the absolute restoration of all the relationships uh, that can add in creation. And that's, uh, uh, you know, that's what we have to keep in mind when, when we look at these scriptures. Yeah, a more holistic vision. I think when we talk about uh, justice, it's also usually used the same word means also righteousness or rightness or right relations, right being, walking humbly with your God and with your neighbor. Yeah. So I got Christine and then I got Dale. Yeah. Okay. If you think of our lives, how we're rooted in the, the scriptures in the Lord, in walking with the Lord day, day in, but as... Bill mentioned this tree went down just so easily because the, tr the wind was so strong for it. And I think we've experienced this over the last few years with the storms that we've had. Our trees have just gone boom. The ice storm, for instance, we had a tree that just went boing. And, um, you know, and I think this is something that we have to get our roots deep in the word to be secure else we will fall yep, yep. Stephen, you mentioned fruit trees there's one fruit tree i think it's the pear it's no use just buying a pear tree and planting it in your garden unless there's another one close by that's right they have to cross pollinate yes yeah so and I think this is why we can't do it alone. We well, that's need... why we have Bible studies, right? <laughs> it's just that we're getting yeah. different perspectives, cross pollinating. Yeah. And the whole, yeah. um, to further it, it's like the Holy Spirit's a little bee. It grabs pollen from one of us and takes it to another person. So maybe I'll make some sermon about it. I got Dale and then yeah, I got Margaret. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you explained that that way, Father Bill, because what jumped out at me was why were the poor sort of uh, segregated from everybody else to be judged? And when you use the word to reconcile with the poor, that has a, a whole different meaning and gives a better sense to what's going on here. That's all I wanted to say. So thank you for that. Thanks a lot for that, Dale. That was it, Margaret. Um, I have always wondered about these passages where we're talking about changing the nature of what we consider the nature of the beast these days. It is the nature of a snake, um, an adder to, to bite and, and to kill. It's the nature of a lion to kill. And this whole uh, picture here has always been a challenge because in this, it's saying that the nature of everything is going to be changed. 
I mean, that's wonderful when, when we consider that some people believe that the nature of man is to be aggressive and fight. And that's why we have wars, because there's some people who are always going to be aggressive. But a bear needs to eat. They all need to eat. And that's how they live. So that's the big question I have about this. How is that going to be reconciled? Everybody's going to eat grass, you know, maybe silly, but it, it's still a bit of a challenge in my mind. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is interesting, too, if you remember back where a few weeks ago, Jesus talked about the angels and they won't be given in marriage. And, I, you know, I think in some ways, Roman Catholics have looked at that at, at times in the past to say, well, obviously, the ideal state is virginity and you go off to a monastery and that's what you do if you really want to be perfect. Whereas that, I think my, my take on that was more to say, well, there's there's a time and place for things, right, which is marriage serves a purpose that's completed in heaven, which means it's meant to be a tool to shape us uh, for the relationships of intimacy that we have in heaven. Just as you know, we won't be having kids, right? But parenting is a very great tool that God uses. Um, and so I would say the same sort of thing is, is that a bear's nature is not like, let's all go out and try to convert bears to veganism, right? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, planting out, you know, tofu salmon out there in the, uh, in, in the rivers so that the bears will feast on them is kind of a fool's project. But it's sort of the idea is to say that this is, this is something that is the result of where we live, right? And, you know, I, I'm, I grew up as a Mennonite, so some Mennonites are very strict pacifists and won't serve as police officers, for example, because sometimes you have to use violence and deadly force to protect the weak. I, I don't agree with them. I think that it's a reality of our world that sometimes uh, you need to counter aggression with, with appropriate use of violence. Having said that, we also know how that's perverted all the time. I'm just doing this for your own good or, or whatever it is, or we're only invading this country for, for its own good and the disasters that it brings about. So, but that again, is, is, the, is, the, is, is the honor God pays to us is to say wisdom, right? Like look at wisdom and when it's appropriate. And obviously it's not appropriate to feed bears tofu, um, but it's also to sort of say, well, how do we work with the constraints of living mortal life today in which it's not perfected? How do we live while we're waiting? So anyway, but it's a good point. And I, I think it's, as Bill was saying, it's easy to say, oh, well, we're all done. So let's just grab some snakes. Well, yeah, <laughs> not introducing any snake handling into our Advent services. Uh, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so John you. and Christine. Yeah, I thought, uh, I, I I was a member of the Boy Scouts Association, and uh, I learned how to fell trees. We had a, a tree that was about a, a foot across in diameter, and uh, in the middle of our, between our neighbor and our, our garage, when we used to live at Woodward Avenue in downtown uh, Ottawa. And I fell about, and that, that uh, tree fell right between the two houses. And however, I sort of looked at the uh, stump that was left, and also I trimmed it, and I trimmed some of the stronger uh, growths from it, and eventually that developed into a, a 30 or 40 foot tree elm tree, I'm talking uh, originally it was du it had got Dutch elm disease. Now it was beginning to become a very fruitful tree and uh, I was getting fruit from it, believe it or not. But uh, I'm saying this as, a, as a, uh, an imagery, look at verse two. What happens with the fruit? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I think that's a wonderful verse. Um, sure it is. really puts it in this whole passage into context. I mean, uh, it's part of even the new covenant wisdom that uh, is being given to us, even if this is in the Old Testament. And I think that's worthy of emphasizing. But there's a, a few things there that I wanted to draw out because, oh, shush. 
My dog's whiny today. Okay. Yeah, you built it. on you. you. No. Um, so a few things is, is that we're, we're going to look at our Matthew passage with John the Baptist, and I, we'll do that in just a minute, but pay attention to some of the resonances that cross over. And there's a, a few. One of them is to remember where the spirit of the Lord rests on him. We don't read this part in the next, but what happens after John the Baptist spiel? Jesus is baptized and the spirit descends on Jesus and rests on him, right? So you got that. You got another thing about what uh, this this righteousness, what the the might and power is of this person, because he says, you know, with righteousness or with justice, he shall judge the poor, decide with equity for the meek. But understand what he's doing when he strikes the earth. He doesn't strike the earth with a sword. He says in verse four, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. This is a reference to his speech, right? So John's gospel is very clear about Jesus being the word, the embodiment of the word. When we read John the Baptist's ministry, what's interesting is, is that he uses very violent imagery. You know, there's, there's a fire it'll be cast into, and there's an ax at the root and all of this. Luke's gospel in chapter three, when he has that same passage, it's really interesting because when he says all these really harsh things about brood of vipers, the people say, well, what are we to do? And then he says, you know, if you got two coats, share one, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting because it also echoes it later in, in Luke's next volume in Acts. It's exactly what Peter says. He says, you know, you crucified Jesus and you did this and this. And people say, well, what should we do? But in Acts, it says a little point. It says they were cut to the heart. And then they asked, what should we do? So there's some sense in which what John the Baptist is doing is he's saying like this, this Jesus will, will slay you with the words of his mouth. He will, he will crack through your armor. He will pierce you right to the heart. And make you face up to the reality, which is, what have you done? You crucified Jesus, or you've been robbing the poor, or you've been mean to your wife, or whatever it is. Like we're dealing with God. We're dealing with somebody, you know, it, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the, of, of the living God, right? And it's not meant to, oh, gosh, my teeth are chattering because he's a real jerk and he might smite me because he's in a bad mood. It's a fearful thing because God will undo all of the lies we tell ourselves. And he will undo the lies that people tell us. And he will leave us there with the truth. And that's a hard thing sometimes. If you've ever had to admit to somebody, I really messed something up, it hurts. It really hurts. And you're a little bit fearful because then you're saying, look, I, I'm laying it bare. I really messed this up. And the person might say, yeah, you did, you jerk. And I'm going to tell everybody what a, whatever you are. Or they could say, you know what? I, I love you and I forgive you. Thank you for the courage of saying that, right? which is what you hope they'll say, but it's still a leap of faith. It's still painful, but you do it. So there's one thing. It's the, it's the emphasis on the word that Jesus unravels people. And you think about his ministry where he, he you know, there's that part where they want to throw him off a, a cliff or when they want to cast stones at this woman, Jesus doesn't say, pick up your swords and let's, he instead says, okay, well, whoever's without sin, go ahead. And he, they're all undone. They can't do anything. Or he walks out of their midst. So I think there's that bit of model about what it means to be a peacekeeper without being a, a, a wuss, right? Which is, he says the truth, but he says, I'm not going to use violence to enforce it. But he slays the wicked with the voice uh, that he gives because he doesn't let them have their own illusions. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is really interesting, too, is, is that he, um, he, he draws a distinction here, too, because Isaiah is talking about uh, his ministry is dominated, first of all, by the threat of Assyria. So the Assyrian Empire coming, which destroyed northern Israel, and then by the threat of Babylon. So both empires that are mighty and powerful. Um, but they are, are ones that are, um, you know, they're powerful empires. They play power politics. And so when there's peace, it's because it's basically a Cold War. Like, okay, I'm not going to attack you because I'm afraid you're really strong and I won't do it. But verse 9 he says that's not the basis of peace. Like we're in an uneasy cold war because we're of equal you know, power. It says, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So it's not just I've assessed your power and I've agreed it's costly to attack you so I won't. It's that we've stopped looking at each other. We've started looking up and we're starting to ask, well, what would God want us to do? 
And I really like that because I think it is also a rule for us when it comes to personal relationships, right? Like you can easily say, well, this guy got more than me. And I remember this happened and I remember this. And it is an endless cycle of vindictiveness. And you see this, of course, in ethnic conflicts that never stop. And you can see this in, you know, really destructive marriages or friendships that really go sour or, or whatever family dynamics. The only way out of it, I think, is to sort of say, well, okay, let's bring these things to God and ask God, what, what do you want me to do? What, what would you want? What's the right thing? And then you stop calculating, well, is this guy getting more than me? And you start saying, well, Jesus, what do you want from me? It kind of disarms some of that conflict. And if you can get to a point where you're both saying that, there is real hope for reconciliation. Because you're no longer saying, uh, let's compare what we're getting. We're instead saying, you know what? You know better, Lord. You know what's best for both of us. And then it makes it easier to let go of some of the grievances. And I, I found just, you know, in my own marriage, my wife and I, for about 10 years now, have been praying morning prayer together every morning. And we'd, all, you know, we'd always pray together, you know, but it would be more sort of snatches of this and this. And we decided that, you know, we want to start the day together. And so it's very rare that we don't. And I, I think it's really helped us. And I don't think we're a high conflict, bad marriage before, but it just sort of feels like both of our orientation is, well, God, how do you want me to spend the day? How do you want me to relate to each other? And I think that's just great when you have friends, you can do that. When you have uh, conflicts in the church, like not just pray so that we can you know, pretend that we don't have a problem. It's can we both acknowledge the lordship of Jesus and ask him, first of all, what do we want? And there's real hope when that happens because he brings light. Anyway, so those are my thoughts about this, but hold on to those as we go on to Matthew and we look at uh, John the Baptist ministry, because it's very, very harsh. Um, and I was worried a little bit when I get this, so I'm preaching this Sunday, so I got to got to polish up my axe and lay it at the, the feet of all of the unworthy sinners in the in the congregation. Christine, you had your hand up? Well, I'm glad we make your life a lot easier without a Bible study before you give your message. Absolutely. <laughs> you, 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 you let me work out the kinks. I do my sort of, what do they call in, in technology, beta testing? You know, you give your prototype, see how it works, get the feedback, and then... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's, Dale, do you, do you want to read for us from Matthew's Gospel, Dale? Uh, no problem. My my version is different, though. You got the amplified version, right? No, I've got the good news. Okay, well, we're due for some good news. So why don't you do that? One of the things that's interesting, I know you did, Bill, when you've led it, is compare translation. So that's really helpful because it lets us know, like, the, the Greek behind it. How is the translator doing this? And different translations show us that there's actually a, a range of meanings. So... I, I uh, laid on a scale. Yeah, no, I find your version is much more embellished than mine is. <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> anyway, yeah. here we go. All right, let's go so straight Matthew, to this. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 12. Right. At that time, John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching. Turn away from your sins, he said, because the kingdom of heaven is near. John was the man the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, someone is shouting in the desert, prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. John's clothes were made of camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. People came to him from Jerusalem, from the whole province of Judea, and from all over the country near the Jordan River. They confessed their sins and he baptized them in the Jordan. When John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, he said to them, you snakes, who told you that you could escape from the punishment God is about to send? Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins. And don't think you can escape punishment by saying that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these rocks and make descendants for Abraham. The ox is red. I'm sorry. The ax is ready to cut down the trees at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. I baptize you with the water to show that you have repented. But the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, 
and I am not good enough even to carry his sandals. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain. He will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn the shaft in a fire that never goes out. The word of the Lord. Thank you to God. Um, Very good. Thank you, Dale. Uh, okay. Questions, comments. Also, a lot there. Just to warn you, it's already 1037. So we've got 23 minutes of discourse we're allowed before we're cut off. Christine. Well, a lot of it is is telling us that some of the things that we've just read in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Worded is worded differently. Mm -hmm. um, I find this little bit about this. I, I understand separating the good grain from the shaft, but that the fire will not go out. Mm. And I and that is my question. <clears throat> he will put part of the grain into his barn, mm -hmm. and but but he will burn the shaft with with a fire that cannot be put out, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> fire can be put out. You just drought water all over it in circumstances, but if you think of certain minerals or oils or whatever that catch fire is very they have to have a special something to put that fire out you know when yep. you've heard train wrecks and you know it's built and the things caught fire you just can't put water on it same right. in the kitchen you can't put water in a fat burning on the stove <laughs> yeah you don't put it on a grease fire you end up no. worse. So <laughs> Billy you had your hand up and then and then dailed it. Oh, I, I was gonna say, um if you've ever thrown uh, a shovel full of sawdust onto a fire, it just sits there and stares at you. Um, but the the underneath that is this smoldery, smoky little fire that burns away, and that shovel full of sawdust will burn sometimes for several days. It just smolders away. And mm -hmm. you could throw water on it, but the water goes only on the top of the sawdust and the fire that's underneath continues to burn and burn away. Um, uh, having thrown sawdust on my fire at the cottage one time and wondered why the fire was still burning two days later. Mm -hmm. But you also see it, for instance, in fires in grain elevators. Mm -hmm because you get this great mass of grain where the fire gets into the very center of it and, and can smolder away uh, in the ruin of the, uh, of the grain elevator. And you have to physically pick up the piles of grain and take them to another place and spread them out for the fire to finish burning. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just leave it there as a, as a ruin and put water on it because the water just runs off. Anyway, just an observation about fires that never go out. And to conclude, to say that when you were putting the chaff uh, from the winnowing of grain onto the fire, um, you've got a great pile of a very dense, uh, very dense product. And it's going on the fire and it's gonna behave like sawdust or grain in a, in a grain elevator. I worked for a fire insurance company one summer. Didn't learn much, but few things stayed in my mind. Gave you some sermon illustrations. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Dale, you had a, had a comment. Okay. Well, the, the word fire struck me and I did a little bit of research last night and I found three different meanings for fire um, in the context of the Bible. One being the power and the presence of God always exists. The other one, uh, have you ever, ha your mom ever say to you, do I have to light a fire under you to get you going? Um, th this, this would be like um, an increase in your intensity to serve God. And the third um, thing that I found was that sometimes we have to get bad, uh, give, give up our bad habits and that 
Um, and, and that can, and like you were saying, um, Father Stephen, that it's hard. And that too is a fire within us to keep going in, 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 in faith to God. And maybe uh, this is very figuratively, um, maybe that is the meaning. I was trying to get some meaning out of that. And that, those were the three things that I found. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there. that's Thank helpful you. or not. That's very helpful. Very good. good. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, uh, how often when God's presence, you see it, you know, as, uh, as John says, you know, he'll, he'll baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire, like fire and light present with, with God. Uh, and there's this sense we got to think about what does that exactly mean, right? It's not like he's God's made a sawdust. I mean, that's a reason that it's on mm -hmm. a fire and it's more than that. So thank you. Margaret, you had a, a point. Um, all of uh, the uh, uh, verse 12, when uh, the winnowing, winnowing fork is in his hand, he'll clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat. But what's left over, the wheat is the good product. What's left over the chaff will be burned. I took that as um, if you do not accept God. And I thought this may be a Catholic um, interpretation that the fire is hell, that those who are not going to be wheat or chaff and will be sent to a fire that never goes out, which to me was hell. Well, I wonder too, like, I think one of the things that's interesting is I think there's lots of different levels in which Jesus speaks or the Bible speaks. And so, I mean, I, I think we've talked about this too. Like, I'm, I don't find it hard to believe that, you know, Hitler's in hell. Um, what I have, uh, I, I think we look at why we think all this stuff is good news is, is that it's actually good news if you want the chaff burned off of your life, right? So instead of sort of saying, well, you're chaff and you're wheat, it's just sort of sort of say like, I'm a pile of, you know, God harvested me and there's a bunch of chaff as well as a bunch of wheat. And part of what the, 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 the danger of approaching God is, is that God's Holy Spirit is very effective at separating wheat from chaff. And some of the chaff I'm holding on to, I really would rather keep holding on to, right? And God says, no, I'm sorry, this needs to be burned. Um, and it's a threatening thing. So, you know, I think John the Baptist preaching is very harsh. And maybe he comes across sort of assuming like, well, obviously, it's separating these people from these. But I also think like Jesus tends to be more and more like he asks tough things, you know, if your eye offend causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's like, be prepared to lose things that are precious to you in in the pursuit of a more holy, righteous life. And so that's kind of where I, I think I would come down on that is to say most of the way I would interpret that is to say, instead of saying, well, therefore, stand on your high horse and say, well, I'm wheat and your chaff. It's to say, well, where am I chaff, God? You know, where am I holding on to? Did you have a response to that Margaret you had your hand up or yes um then I mean I much prefer that interpretation yeah. <laughs> um, and then think of refiner's fire <clears throat> yeah. refiner's fire that fire is always going but there's a refinement going on so perhaps yeah. that's another way of looking at it yeah I mean I think that there's that real purgative quality the fire has right mm -hmm. so Dale had mentioned that about um yeah you that know, that was my fight eat. with it too, because once if 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 you're discarded to hell, it's done, it's finished. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess one of my my thoughts too is just to sort of say like, um, I don't know if your your whole life is is built out of straw. What's left after God burns the chaff, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. So I don't want to sort of assume like you're a straw life and I'm built a solid stone because I'm very Christian and faithful. I, I think it's just to sort of say with humility, it's like, well, it, it's not my job to judge where another person's at. My job is to be honest about where I'm at and honestly ask God to show me where I'm at so that I might faithfully walk with him. And I think that that's the temptation has always been. Here's Jesus's teaching and that guy over there really needs to hear it. Instead of saying, well, here's Jesus teaching and I really need to hear it. And um Anyway, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at. And I, I think it's very reasonable to sort of say, like, I, God comes or Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. It's not me who's coming to judge the living and the dead. It's him. So I, I'm very uncomfortable with the you're in and you're out way. But I leave it to God to make those decisions because he knows the human heart and he also respects our decisions. Right. I mean, I think it's entirely possible for a person to say, like in, in John Milton, right, 
Paradise Lost. Satan's whole shtick is, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And God says, fine, <laughs> go ahead. I love uh, you, the gift that you want. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll give you what, what you want. And <laughs> so the real key is like to human beings, you know what? What you want from me is actually better than what I want for myself, God. And that's the ultimate act of trust. Mm. And that's a really hard thing because so often I know what's best. But, you know, you remember from teenage years, right? Obviously, what's best is you give me the keys and let me stay out all night and do whatever I want to do, obviously. And then you look back at it and think, man, I'm, I'm glad my parents said no to that because I would have really wrecked my life. And I think that to realize that God, unlike my parents who are mortal and make mistakes, God doesn't. But um, that's the tough thing. You know, autonomy is just what we are all used to. So, John and Christine, you got your hand up? Yeah, the, uh, in my version here on verse eight, it said, do the things that show you really have changed your hearts and lives. And then to those who do not will be punished. And I think it's a, a lesson for us today that we have to continue committing ourselves daily to the Lord for strength and courage to go through each day because of the life of the world we're living in, that we don't let it take, take us away from our walk with the Lord. Well, like you'll tell us, don't be conformed to this world, right? And it's very easy to do that, right? Like, well, you know, this is just the way things are done. But you know, that's well, part I of the reason why things like slavery persisted so long. This is, there's no real argument for slavery. And yet it's, it's always been with us so we're just going to keep it. Um, and I'll try and Christianize it by being nice to my slaves instead of doing the right thing, which is slavery is evil. But I think well, that that's going along to get along is really a temptation for everybody. I yeah. think it, we're all in a situation now with John's home care worker this morning. We were talking about Christmas and she said, what are you going to do for the holidays? I said, it's not holidays. Come on. You know, it isn't. She says, I know. And this is, this is what we face with. We have to start making a stand, not making a big issue of it, but it's Christmas. It's a celebration for us of, of the child, Christ child. It's not, it might be a holiday for some people, but for, for those who it isn't, it's, it's a celebration of looking, now looking forward. That poem that uh, Alana read out on Sunday, I Googled it and I printed it off. And it's, it's very interesting to, to read it, not just once, but go back to it and see how we to prepare ourselves for the Christ child and not let people direct, you know, what route are you going? You're on a road, you come to a fork in a road. Which one are you going to take? The one. I think well it comes back to to, you know, as you say, you know, for for ourselves, right? Which is, I'm really the belief that we have a lot to learn for the Jewish people about how you survive in a culture that's hostile to you. Mm -hmm. And what the Jewish people have done is, they have really embraced, you know, their their traditions, so that you know, in family at Passover Seder suppers. You know, you get Jewish people who at, is it Sukkot, where they build the Feast of Tabernacles, and you'll, you'll find some Jewish families will build like a full-on, you know, tabernacle in their front lawn, uh, you know, as a celebration of, of when Israel was in, in its tents. Uh, you know, and, and in other words, to, to sort of say, like, the world's not going to follow along. Uh, instead, I'm going to say, as for me and my house, they will serve the Lord. And so to ask yourself, well, what do I need to do in order to encourage my faithfulness to Christ? So part of that is, yes, we do our personal Bible study, but I think a huge part of it is what we're doing now, which is we connect with other people and say, you know, I'm not saying I'm better than other people, but I'm saying there's something that we on this call share that not everybody around us does. And you reinforce your faith, I think, when you have shared uh, disciplines, like a, a weekly Bible study, when you have shared traditions of Christmas and say, you know, I'm do whatever you want to do, but I'm, you know, going to put up my Christmas tree and I'm going to do Advent candles and I'm going to do the different things that I and my family will reinforce my faith. So I think we also, you know, as Jesus does, right? You come to the world in a from a place of humility. You know, Jesus comes as a carpenter's son, just some schmuck, and everybody always says, like, is this not the carpenter's son? Who does this guy think he is? 
He just keeps telling the truth. And he associates with the lowly. And he spends time with his disciples. And even more so, he's, he's got his three really close, Peter, James, and John. So Jesus, I think, establishes routines with them and spends real time with them because there's no substitute. You spend time with other people. And Jesus uh, builds a community. And, you know, the church existed because slaves and women and former pagans and who knows what. They came and they found that there are people who remembered who they were, who loved them. And we share, you know, Paul takes them to task in Corinthians. Like, you're not sharing your food, the, the, the poor, right? You're having some nice party while they wait outside. We share things in common because around this table, we're all alike, around the Lord's table. So I think that these are encouragements for us to come and say, well, we're going to hold on to the gospel and we're going to do what we can with the people we can. And not, you know, fret over the, the, the difficulties of the world. Um, we love the world, but that ship has sailed. It's not going to be Christmas anymore. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, but I think that it can be still something we say, like, I don't care what the world celebrates. I care that Jesus was born in our world and I'm going to celebrate. And anyway, that's my take on it. Other thoughts? We got about seven minutes. So I want to leave a couple minutes for prayer. Bill? Oh, I was just going to say one of the things. I'm not sure where the idea came from. Who knows? But uh, it strikes me that within the Christian community, we need to uh, begin a conversation with regard to Christmas mm -hmm. that says um, Santa Claus is different from Jesus because. Mm -hmm. And an example of the answer, the finishing of the sentence is, Jesus is different from Santa Claus because Jesus loves you regardless. Yeah. Uh, Santa he loves, loves those on the naughtiness too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jesus is different from Santa Claus because Jesus is always there. Uh, as opposed to Santa is only around for two weeks out of the year. Um, Jesus is different from Santa Claus because, and, and each of us, we don't need to finish any more of that, but it's a conversation. I think that we need to, uh, we need to begin to have and um, uh, in the church. And then the other thing that I've always liked about this passage, especially when I've had to preach on it, is the visuals in the passage i can see john the baptist mm -hmm. standing on a rock near the jordan valley um and uh where all the soil around it and the sand around it and the clay around it has been eroded by the floods of the jordan and here's this rock that that he's standing on and the various audiences who wouldn't have i think have been mingled together the Sadducees and the Pharisees together and the soldiers there and the poor who heard him gladly right in front of him and so on. And when he would say, now you guys, he was pointing at people and I can see his clothing and uh, I've never had wild locusts, but I, I'm told if you deep fry them, they're actually quite tasty with a bit of salt. Um, um, I... <laughs> Okay, I knew we've all had breakfast and, and coated in chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> that would be even better. But I'm told they can <clears throat> quite delicious. So that go go ahead, Bill. You're finished. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I just the visual imagery of it is really powerful, is huge. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time because it's going to cut off in four minutes. A couple things. Just uh, I was thinking too. It just kind of came to me again. Uh, tale of what we're talking about marker but the trees going into the fire do remember that we just talked about the stump of jesse where it seemed like a tree that had been chopped down and thrown into the fire that god brings new life there so it is sometimes possible that god really shakes us up down to the core but there's the possibility of new life because a new sprout so i don't think it necessarily means you know who we are as you know a core of who we are is always <coughs> condemned there's hope there I guess the other thing, too, is interesting is um, he talks about bearing good fruit. I also makes me think, too, about churches, right, and church communities. Like, to say, well, we, we need to keep open. Sometimes we just sort of say we need to keep going just because we've always been going. 
when maybe we need to be asking is, are we bearing fruit? Are people coming to believe more in God as a result of what we do? Do they believe in God's goodness? Are we making God's goodness credible because of the work we do amongst the lonely or the poor um, and the message that we're sending? So it's a, it's a worthwhile thing to sort of ask like, okay, well, are, are we making Jesus look good? <laughs> That's I guess maybe another way of saying it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Three minutes. Uh, I'm going to say a little prayer to close us off. Next week will be an in-person uh, Eucharist here at the church. And then the week after that, we'll be back to Zoom. So do pay attention to your weekly uh, email. It'll come on Monday to remind us, but it's in-person. And so if you're able to come, that would be great. It's there in the chapel here at the church. And uh, Christmas comes soon. So pay attention to the events that are going on in the next few weeks. Because uh, we, we're having our lessons and carols on Saturday. It's a really great, great service. There's no sermon. It's just songs and scripture. And it just really reminds us. And God's got a long view of things. We may think, oh, my gosh, things are bad or they're good. And it's like, well, just wait. God's got a big plan. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for gathering us and just for the rich, uh, the richness of the scriptures. There's so much we could talk about. Thank you for the imagery. Please bless us with the knowledge that we are, are, are worth uh, so much because you love us so much. Help us not to be uh, terrorized, but help us instead to trust you enough to let you take away the chaff in our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. everybody. We have a minute and a half. There, so good job. <laughs> thank All you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. All right.